The product rule for limits may seem obvious to you, but the actual proof is not that trivial. The trick is to rewrite the difference of the functions, or the difference of the limit, as the sum of some terms from which you know that you can make them small. After this, we do the usual epsilon delta maneuvering as we did in some previous proofs, so then it becomes standard. But this first uh, step is quite tricky, as we'll see. So, it's the product rule. If uh, the limit x to f of x equals L1, limit x to f g of x equals L2, so both limits exist, then a uh, limit of the product equals L1 times L2. So, what is the given then? What do we know and what do we need to prove? So, given is that uh, for every epsilon 1 bigger than 0, uh, we can uh, uh, make f uh, arbitrarily close to L1, uh, given x is picked close enough to uh, a. So, we can find a delta 1 such that uh, if x minus a absolute value is smaller than delta 1, that f gets close to L1. Similarly, for every epsilon 2 bigger than 0, there also exists a delta 2 such that g gets close to L2. So we can get f close to L1, we can get g close to L2, provided we take x close enough to a. So what do we have to show? Well, we want to show that we can get f times g arbitrarily close to L1 times L2, provided we take x close enough to a. So we have to show that f times g minus L1 times L2, that we can get it smaller than some any epsilon, provided we take x close enough to a. How are we going to do that? Well, that's a bit of a mess. We use the following trick. We write f times g minus L1 times L2. We keep the f times g, and we write the L1 times L2, it's the minus sign, really strange. We write here, f minus L1 times g minus L2. So we have the last term will be a L1 times L2, which we need. But we also have too many terms. First of all, we have a f times g, so we need to subtract that. Then we get a, a f minus L2, so we have uh, uh, to add plus f times L2, and we get a g times L1, so we have to add a g times L1. Why do we do this? Well, these terms over here, will be small. We can get rid of them. Let's just hope that we can make the other terms small as well. Well, let's see. We end up with the f times g, and here we have an other, a minus minus f times g, so a 2 f times g. We have a minus f times l1 and minus g times l1, over here and over there, and the product here which becomes small. And now, you see, we can use a first factor f times g together with the uh, f times L2 to get the f times g minus L2. Hey, that's nice, because we can make that small. And we can use the other f times g to combine it with the minus g times L1. And that's also nice, because we can make this term small. And we have a third term which we can make small. So now we have written f times g minus L1 times L2 as a sum of three terms, and all of those three terms we can make all of all three of them small. So we have norm of f times f g minus l1 times l2, use the triangle inequality, is smaller equal than the sum of the three norms, first term, second term, third term. So that was the first major step. The part which we want to get small is now smaller than the sum of three terms, which we can make small separately. Uh, but first we have to be able to do something with the norm of the f and norm of the g. We have to see that they, those are bounded. So, what do we do? Well, uh, we know that we can make f minus l1 smaller than epsilon 1. So that means that we can uh, our f between l1 minus epsilon 1 and l1 plus epsilon 1. And in particular that means that we can make the norm of our f smaller than <coughs> l1 plus epsilon 1 and with the triangle inequality smaller than L1 plus epsilon 1. That's in order to be sure that our f stays bounded. And we can uh, do this, a similar trick for g. That means that we have our same f times g minus L1 times L2 in norm, smaller or equal than we 
keep the G minus L1 L2 over here. We keep the F minus L1 over here. And we keep this term over here, which is already fine. And we use the fact that we can bind both the norms of F and G in a similar way. And then set uh, N the maximum of the two limits, number bigger than zero. And, th and then we can replace the norm of L1 and the norm of L2 by M if we use a smaller than sign over there. So we have a M plus epsilon 1 times epsilon 2, M plus epsilon 2 times epsilon 1, and epsilon 2 1 times epsilon 2. Use those three terms. So our F minus FG minus L1 times L2 is smaller than some combination of, psi of epsilons, which is fine because we can get uh, this for any epsilons, so we can get this small. So how are we going to choose now our delta given some epsilon bigger than zero, given our m bigger than zero, where m was the maximum of the two limits. Um, uh, then we choose our epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 the same, and how do we choose it? We choose uh, the minimum of two values, epsilon over 4m, and uh, square root of epsilon over square root of 6. Um, and then we choose uh, our delta 1 such that uh, our f minus l1 is bigger than smaller than epsilon 1, provided x is uh, minus a smaller than delta 1, and similarly for our g uh, with the epsilon 2 and delta 2. And then we know those deltas, we pick the minimum of the two, and then we know our uh, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are smaller equal than those quantities. Why did we choose them like this? Well, then we know this m over epsilon 1 is at most epsilon over 4m. So our m of times epsilon 1 becomes smaller than uh, m times epsilon over 4m. Similarly for the m times uh, epsilon 2 also becomes at most uh, epsilon over 4m, so also bounded by uh, m times epsilon over 4m. And the last term, 3 times epsilon 1 times epsilon 2, therefore we needed this strange factor over here is smaller than the square root of epsilon over square root of 6, so smaller than 3 remains there, the square root of epsilon over square root of 6, and the square root of epsilon over square root of 6, and then if you add up all terms, you get 1 quarter epsilon plus 1 quarter epsilon plus 1 half epsilon equals epsilon. So, and then you see that you can get f times g arbitrarily close to L1 times L2, provided you pick x close enough to uh, at uh, a, well, this is a proof is quite some tricks, and when you try to make proofs like this, you really it's really a puzzle to find the correct choice of your epsilons and deltas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in order to do exercises like this, this really requires some practice. But fortunately, there are some exercises about it. So, try to do to do those yourself.